everybody and welcome to the next edition of Film Music House. My name is Chandler Poling with White Bear PR. I am so excited to present this next uh, panel speaker. I'm here with Emmy winning composer, Laura Cartman. We are here today in collaboration with Perspective Forum and the Alliance for Women Film Composers to bring this incredible content of music that is applied to television in this particular case of the Film Music House. Even though we're called Film Music House, we are here to talk about the amazing power of music and television. So Laura, talk to me, like where did you get your first ounces of musical education and where did you feel you started to apply that to film music? Well, it's it's such a long road and it would take the entire, uh, your entire, panel with everybody's on it, but I'm glad to be here. Thanks for welcoming me. Um, you know, when I was growing up, I started writing music very young and I, it wasn't my dream to be a film composer. I, I grew up in LA and um, my dad had a lot of, he, he was a cardiologist and he had a lot of, you know, celebrity patients. And I, and I had went to school with a lot of kids who were, whose parents were celebrities or producers, directors. And I, um, I just had no interest in it. I wanted to be an East Coast intellectual. And um, when I was a kid, I sort of, as I said, I started writing music, but I also started listening to a lot of jazz and studying jazz. And I started scat singing um, and I memorized all of Ella Fitzgerald's solos from all of her albums. And I just got deep into vocal music and I became a pretty good singer. Um, and when I went to University of Michigan School of Music, uh, I went in composition, but my principal instrument was a voice. So I, at that point was, kind of singing in bars and you know like I was playing for you before we got on I would do you know you know I used to be yeah. better but there it is I love that. um anyway um but I started also studying opera and what was really cool is when I was an undergraduate at University of Michigan because I wasn't going to be a professional singer, they let me sing everything. So I would study, you know, like, uh, you know, Verdi and, and Stravinsky, and I would sing arias that were not at all in my range. At that point, I was a coloratura soprano, which is like, you know, up there. I mean, I was, it's, I can't do it anymore. But, you know, I sang, oh, for Louis, you know, Verdi and all that kind of stuff. And, and, um, it, just I had a great time and I fell in love with singing and opera and I think opera was my gateway drug to film scoring really yes I do because I started like really getting into this idea of what music and drama meant and how they interacted and um, I started reading a lot of plays. Like I remember I was reading like a lot of Eugene O'Neill, Shakespeare, all kinds of playwrights. I would go see opera when I, finally when I got to Juilliard to do my master's and my doctorate at that point, um, Beverly Sills, who was a great American soprano, was singing at the New York City Opera. And the thing about Beverly Sills is that she was um, gymnastic. I mean, she like listening to her sing was like going to the Olympics of vocal stuff. And it, it was crazy. I would go and hear music that I had absolutely no interest in, like this, you know, this coloratura stuff that goes like you know, these very fast runs in, in vocal music. And, you know, anyway, I, I really immersed myself deep in opera. And I, um, I would listen to pieces over and over again. And the two pieces that I really remember the best were um, a Britain's A Midsummer's Night Dream and then also a piece by Samuel Barber called Summer, Knoxville of I think 1950 and I can't remember the year, but there was this seminal recording with Leontine Price um, and maybe you'll play that for your listeners um, that stuck in my head and I think became a model of sorts for me. And when we get back to talking about Lovecraft Country, um, I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. But, but really I started getting deep into opera and playing around with opera and musical theater. And after Juilliard, I went to the Sundance Institute 
um, in its first iteration when David Newman was running it. And I saw computers and music and MIDI work together for the first time. This is the late eighties when all of that was brand new. Um, and for me, that was like, it was so the technology of it and this kind of interacting with music and visual material was, I, I mean, I was gobsmacked. It changed my whole life. Incredible. And that was kind of, that was the beginning of, of kind of this merging of, of who I was or who I thought I was going to be um, with who I am. Right. Yeah. And I know that was a, that was a, uh, a loaded question to get because you, you had to go a long way in a short. I did. I'm time. sorry. I had to go way back. No, it's important because obviously the point of this panel, it's called Write What You Know, and it's about applying your personal skills or applying the skills of what you've learned through your education to film scoring. So obviously you come from a much different background coming from as a vocalist into opera, Juilliard. This is not quite the norm of film composers in our industry. So I wanted to know how, what you picked up along the way, how you've applied it. I've heard, I heard, you know, you did a little scat demonstration and I've heard that used in your Paris Can Wait score. Oh yeah, you, I little, sang on that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we got Uta Lemper, who's way better than I am too, but yes, <laughs> you know, I do, I love, I, you know, when I can, I love to still sing on stuff. Yeah, and that's an incredible that's an incredible uh, tool that you picked up along the way that you can apply into your film scoring. And, yeah. and in, that part, in that particular film, it came out so well; it was perfect fit for it. But let's um, let's dive into opera. Like, like, like we're on a great path with opera, and you have a Grammy-winning album for "Ask Your Mama," and you use this incredible singer. Why don't you tell us a little bit about "Ask Your Mama" and how that kind of led you down the road into even more deep into the film music world? I will, but I'm gonna I'm gonna back up and and kind of answer a, a, a question that was implied in, in your last question, and that is that. You know, as a singer, um, singing in my scores is not the only way that I've used it effectively. I've used it to sing to clients a lot. So that if somebody's coming over and I'll give you a perfect example. I won't say what it is because I just, um, we just got the gig and I don't think it's public, but I basically sat on a Zoom call last week with a guitar tuned down there. Right. And the guitar was um, I don't play guitar, but I but I detuned it to be CEG. And this was um, or CGC. And this was a, a an audition. It's a it's a job that actually Raphael and I are doing together. And I had this idea and I just started singing. And it was almost just an improvised thing. We got the gig. So literally over the Zoom call, I said, look, it, this, I had this idea and this is, does this sound right to you? And it was a risk, right? Yeah, But it was, it was a good demonstration. And because it's singing, even if there are no vocals that wind up being used in the score, it's very expressive. And so I think using your voice in, in all the kind of the metaphor, but in the, in the non-metaphoric sense, it, in demonstrating themes to people in it, you know, sitting at the piano, if we, when we get back to that again, when clients come to the house, I think it's a really, really good way to demonstrate your ideas with being specific, but you're not sitting at the computer. You're not apologizing for a mini mock-up. You're just sitting with a client at the guitar or at the piano and talking about stuff. Okay. Um, I love so, that. That's a great. That's a great kind of interstitial because yeah. it's a, it's a way that you. Um, it's a great tip for for composers to also understand of how to communicate with clients and filmmakers. Is that sometimes it's it's rather than like you said, ap be apologists about it or over explaining music because music's hard to explain. Just sing it or just hum it or just yeah that's that's a great great advice i had a piano teacher when i was a kid um who was a jazz musician and she taught me how to play piano i've just moved the whole computer how to play piano and keep talking because you have to if you if you wind up working in a bar so you've got to be able to talk and, and play at the same time that has been like my number one most useful skill as a composer because I can sit here and do this like I'm doing with you and I continue to talk. 
talk and say, now I'm going to, I have this idea, you know, and, and just express it in a really nice presentation, presentational way. All right. Anyway, ask your mama. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a really beautiful story and that I had had right smack in the middle of my career, a big success with Taken. Uh, which was a, a 20 hour miniseries that I did for Steven Spielberg and um, all the agents in town were calling me and it was like like a real like one of those bursting points at that point I thought I was going to break out and be like I thought the world was waiting you know and they told me that you know yeah. <laughs> um, well it wasn't and um, the phones did not ring and I got low and I started, um, I wanted to do something. And I'd written this music for a CBS miniseries. Um, they said they wanted neo-noir music. And so I wrote this kind of neo-noir music, but it was too jazzy for them. And it all got rejected, understandably so, because it was pretty out there. And um, I thought, you know, I want to do some sort of recording project. And I wasn't busy. And I went to the bookstore and was looking for like beat poetry or jazz poetry or something. And I came across the poetry of Langston Hughes, which of course, I should have known well, but when I was a kid, we didn't learn the poetry of Langston Hughes in school. And I was blown away because it's so musical. Um, he's so musical and it's music is inextricably bound in all his poetry. And there was a poem where music was truly inextricably bound. Um, and it's Ask Your Mama. And literally it's his longest poem. And on the right-hand margins of the poem, um, Langston Hughes says how the music should sound, literally telling you what to do. Mm. So it's German leader transforms into to well bar blues was one direction from Langston Hughes, which is perfect for me because I knew German leader and I knew the 12 bar blues. And I felt like I was a good person to try to make his vision come to life. Um, although others have done a wonderful job at it as well. And, um, and this text of Langston was like working with the director, right? I mean, except somebody who was incredibly musically um, imaginative and 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 uh, specific in a way, in a musical way. You know, we ask directors to be more generalists, right? So, and talking to us in terms of um, you know actors, and in terms of like talk to us like actors with with emotional beats. So. Anyway, to make a long story slightly longer, um, I loved this poem and I knew there had to be a time that I had to do it. And I set it aside and uh, a number of years later, I had the opportunity to meet Jesse Norman who recently died. She was a great, great, great American singer and a beautiful musical mind. And um, I put together a piece, it became a commission by Carnegie Hall. It featured The Roots and Jesse and Nina Freelon, the great jazz singer. And it has been done multiple places um, at the Bowl, at, uh, at uh, the Apollo Theater and at Carnegie Hall as well, some other, um, some other institutions. And um, when I did the recording, which won a Grammy, uh, we were nominated for three. I hired this woman named Janai Brueger to sing Jesse's part because she didn't want to record it at that point. And Janai sounds to me like Leontine Price. Now you remember at the beginning of this conversation, I said I was completely obsessed with Leontine Price and Samuel Barber. Um, Ask Your Mama was a big success. And in fact, and here's the big surprise and what I think is so such a useful thing for young composers. Um, it opened up a ton of scoring work for me because um, Casey Lemons, who, was a friend of mine and works regularly with Terrence Blanchard. Terrence was unavailable for a film and uh, Raphael Sadiq was doing the songs for the film and Raphael was interested in doing score. And I said, well, you know, let me collaborate with, with him. And it was, a, it was a Langston Hughes book that was being made into a movie and Casey had worked with me um, a little bit on Ask Your Mama, sort of on a consulting basis, making sure that I was, um, that I was head in the right direction. And um, it was really, um, it, it, it opened up this collaboration with Raphael, which has been huge, which led to Underground and Underground led to Lovecraft Country, same showrunner, Misha Green. So you just don't know 
what's going to take you where. And writing that piece, Ask Your Mama, which I did out of my heart and because I felt compelled to, had nothing to do with film music, led, led back to, I think, a resurgence in my career and, uh, uh, and also beautiful musical friendships and deep other friendships with Raphael, with Tara Stinson, who also is a dear friend who wound up singing on the album and, and we've collaborated with on many, many, many yeah projects that's a very you told me not to give long answers and i'm giving you these endless answers and i apologize well so what you're saying is you're laying down the story bits of of where how you kind of got to where you are now right. but what kind of musical skills were you applying in those moments and how are they now being used in your career um, I mean, Lovecraft Country is a great example of of writing an opera for primetime television, which I, I can't say the last time that's happened. <laughs> so, you know, obviously, you, how did you even pitch this opera to be in an HBO show? And and how did you get to this point of, of uh, having that in, in Lovecraft? So episode nine is uh, is the episode that we're talking about. And episode nine explores the Tulsa Massacre of 1921. And um, this was June of last year. So this is when the country was on fire because of the murder of George Floyd, uh, that this came up to be scored. And it was a, it was a really, um, it continues to be a challenging, deep moment for us as a country to look at who we are, who we've been, how we're culpable for probably the greatest crime in human history, which is American slavery. So this, it, the Tulsa massacre, I've just re finished reading Isabel Wilkerson's um, book Cast, which talks a lot about, about the, the massacre. And I recommend that reading for everybody who wants to understand American history and understand what's going on in this country. Um, the Tulsa massacre was, was particularly pernicious because a white gang basically um, murdered and burnt down a center of black wealth in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And the, you know, this had a personal story within the series, but I think one of the reasons why um, it's so significant is because it destroyed black wealth for generations. So not only were those people killed, not only were their families killed, not only were their businesses destroyed, but their children and their children's children and their children's children's children who could have inherited that wealth were denied that opportunity. So it was, it was a terrible, terrible thing. So Misha Green had wanted to use, had, or had, they had licensed this Sonia Sanchez poem that had some, um, had some music behind it. I, I, won't, I won't read the whole thing to you, but I'll read you part of it. Sometimes I wonder what I say to you now in the soft afternoon air as you hold us all in a single death. I say, where is your fire? I say, where is your fire? You got to find it and pass it on. You've got to find it and pass it on from you to me, from me to her, from her to him, from the son to the father, from the brother to the sister, from the daughter to the mother, from the mother to the child. Where is your fire? I say, where is your fire? Can you smell it coming out of our past? The fire of living, not dying. The fire of loving, not killing. Killing. The fire of blackness, not gangster shadows. Where's our beautiful fire that gave to the world, the fire of pyramids, the fire that burned through the holes of slave, ship and slave ships and made us breathe. And the poem goes on. Um, and so when I heard that, and of course, it couldn't be more relevant. Now it couldn't have been more relevant then. It, it, it sadly continues to be utterly relevant. I said to Misha, look, why don't we do a requiem for the victims of, of um, of this massacre. Mm -hmm. And what I thought is let's do a piece of opera and let's write, I wanna write an aria. I wanna reset this text, okay? I'm gonna read you the text of, um, of what I set, okay? And she said, good, try it. And um, what I, so I lifted from the poem and I reduced it, okay? Sometimes I wonder what I say to you now in the soft afternoon air as you hold us all in a single death. I say, where's your fire? Okay, so that's exactly like the original Sonia Sanchez. 
I'm going to play, play it very badly and sing it even worse on the piano, right? Which I can't see. Um, sometimes I wonder what to say to you now. In the soft afternoon, I don't have those Fs anymore. As you hold us all in a single shot, I say, where is your fire? So the idea was to take this and set it very differently than you had already heard it earlier in the episode, OK? Mm. Um, one of the really beautiful things that happens in the aria is that she starts to call out to people. And here, let me just find it. Um, here in the original, she says, uh, hey, brother, brother. So B-R-O-T-H-E-R -E slash B-R-O-T-H-A, sister, sister. And in, in my opinion, that means she's calling everybody. Mm -hmm. Here is my hand, catch the fire and live, 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 live. And I, I used those words. And later on, earlier, she says, sister, sister, brother, brother, come, come. So I started repeating that over and over again. So, sister, sister. told you about the Samuel Barber way yeah. back when I was an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. I call this piece, piece Catch the Fire, Tulsa 1921. And for me, it was an acknowledgement of the Barber piece, Knoxville, summer of 1915. Mm. Wow. And it's a, I think that for me, one of the important things is that Janai Brueger has been my vocal muse. She sings the way I want to sing. You know, <laughs> she's got, she's my, she's the voice of my mind. Mm. And I think Leontine Price was that for Samuel Barber. And so I allowed myself at this point in my life as a very established a composer has been doing this for a long time to um, think of myself as Samuel Barber as a great American composer. And that for me was um, good. That is good. You yeah. know, that was, that was good. And I, and I feel like I deserve it. And I feel the piece, the piece does that. And, and it, it very much comes from, the barber and yet it's been through you know this is we're talking since i was an undergraduate in college so we're talking a lot of years it, it's evolved with me it's evolved with my experience my experience you know as a human being my experience as a queer person my experience as an outsider my experience and these deep collaborations with jesse and Raphael and tara and misha uh, and janai and then you know and then it comes out into this so there it is there it is so, you know, uh, just hearkening back to the name of this panel you says, is to write what you know. So obviously you are utilizing your inspirations from all the way back to, you know, your undergrad and, and, and whatnot. Um, can you talk just a little bit about some of the, so learning music in that time of your age and where you are applying that now? Obviously opera is not, not everybody's given the opportunity to write an opera so for a show. So where do you feel that you can work those moments into your everyday kind of scoring? Well, I mean, I think there, I think it's kind of a, I would say two things. 
you know, first of all, I mean, all of my education comes to bear in my writing. You know, li for me, listening, having listened to a lot of music, having listened to a lot of orchestral scores, not just film composers, um, in fact, not even mostly film composers, but, um, you know, Barber, Ludoslavsky, Bartok, Stravinsky, um, Leonard Bernstein, Leonard Rosamond, you know, um, Thea Musgrave. I mean, I, I can go on and on and on and on. And really um, having those sounds somewhere in the back of my head after spending so much time studying orchestral music and studying opera when I was a younger person, those things come to bear. And, you know, if I have to come up with something really fast, that stuff somehow lives in my ears. So I would encourage younger composers in your downtime, listen to music and follow scores. Even if it's hard for you to do so, it will help you so, so, so much um, in terms of your reading, score reading, and just coming up with ideas. Um, also something I use all the time, and now we're having um, lunchtime ear training with my son, Benny, and with my with my assistant, Amelia. You know, like like things that you think are so tedious, like, what interval is that? You know, it's perfect fourth. There it is again, perfect fourth and octave displacement. Those are things that you need to know when you're on the scoring stage because you've got to be able to hear, you know, I wrote that, but the 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 piccolo's playing that, you know, oh, that's an F sharp, it, that should be an F. So you can call out errors. So ear training, I, I'm sure they're like great programs, but you can also just sit down at the keyboard and close your eyes and just hit notes and you've got to be able to identify all those intervals yeah. so that's that's like one of those crazy things that i use all the time um but i think i think you know it's funny because being a film composer has made me a better opera composer and being an opera composer has made me a better film composer so um I think that those two, those two sort of parts of my life um, play together very nicely. Wonderful. Well, my last question I wanted to ask you is you've labeled yourself as a maximalist. Mm -hmm. You've said that to me, <laughs> where more is more. Um, how would you say that being a maximalist in your personal taste is, uh, is useful to you as a, as a composer in film and television? Well, as you can see, I go with your stripes. Right, your 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 lounge your lounge uh, your lounge wear in the back there with yeah. my lounge wear on my body. <laughs> um, listen, I it, I like writing dense, even complicated music. You're not supposed to do that, you know, as a film composer. No. <laughs> um, but I do it all the time. And part of what happens is if you're going like, if you're doing. And then you become very. You become very simple out of, I mean, that's just a little improvisation, but, but you can use density to really offset simplicity. And I think that's something that I do too. Well, you know, that, that having a simple, beautiful melody um, is so very important. And sometimes it sounds all the more beautiful when it's come out of thicker textures, but you have to be in control of those textures. Yeah, and that, that you learn how to do by studying composition and studying music. Well, and what it does also is it sets you apart from, uh, you know, to create your own audio signature. You know, if you're known for being a maximalist, people will seek you out for, yeah. for those for those dense textures that, you know, then fade away into more, you know, gentle, gentle melodies or however you want to word it. But um, yeah, I think that's, that's a, uh, it, it's just a, a thing that I remember always of how you described <laughs> yourself. Well, you know, I, I hid it for years and then I finally decided to come out of the closet, you know, and just admit, admit the truth. Yeah. But, you know, it's funny because when I first started writing film music um, and I came from studying Mil from Mil uh, I came from studying with Milton Babbitt at Juilliard, who was very much a mass, a mass, I can't even say it, a maximalist and a de dodecaphonist, a 12 tone serial composer. Um, I started doing television movies. And for those of you, most of you will be too young to remember this time, but they were these terrible movies that were on the four networks, but it was bonanza in terms of work because every Sunday night, 
all four networks would produce these movies. And I would do like five or six of them a year and the royalties were great and it's great, great work. And I don't disparage it. However, I had to learn how to write a simple melody and I'd never done it in my life, ever. And because you don't have time you don't, have an, an, you don't have an opportunity to get to the emotional rawness and those things. Like they're right off the bat, emotionally raw. And they're like, you can see these movies on Lifetime now, you know, they still have them and they still air them. Yeah. But it, it, that was great training for me too, as a film composer, I had to simplify. I had to learn how to get to the point right away and not dilly dally around with a lot of musical ideas. So as important as it is to be a maximalist to me, it's also important to have coherent, um, and recognizable melodies that are singable and gettable. Absolutely. Well, Laura, thank you so much for taking the time to oh, talk today. I loved hearing about your journey to, to this point and congratulations on Lovecraft Country and, and being able to apply opera, one of your loves into your career in, in television and film scoring. And it's just all very, very exciting. So. Oh. Thanks, Chandler. I appreciate it. It's a lot of fun to talk to all of you. And but listen, I hope you get something out of it. All right. Yes, me too. I hope everybody gets to learn something really awesome. I certainly did. Okay. Anyways, stay tuned for more content from the Film Music House Summer Edition.